We're highly social creatures as humans. The connections and bonds we build have many practical and emotional benefits to our well-being. And almost no bond is spoken about more than romantic relationships. But just because we seek them doesn't mean they're easy to come by, nor that they'll last as long as we want them to. The secret to your ideal relationship starts by fully understanding what it entails. You have to begin with the psychology behind it and remove all the misinformation that's been drilled into your subconscious. By the end of this video, relationships will make even more sense for you and you can begin to approach them in a better, healthier way. This is gonna be such a profound and deep video going down the topic of relationships and the psychology behind relationships, more so on the romantic side. But the things you learn in this video will be insights that you can apply to relationships that aren't just romantic, but predominantly today we're gonna to focus on romantic relationships. When we talk about the psychology relationships, a word that often comes to mind is love. But what is love exactly? Love is really an umbrella term that represents many forms of feelings and expressions. So when you think of love, a lot of times society associates it with romance, but love can be in many different forms, AKA archetypes or types of love. You see love in family dynamics, friend groups, you see love of self, and also you have universal love. You can have love towards the planet, love towards animals, love towards the universe and just existence as a whole, love for all things. And you know, when we talk about these different areas, love can have different gradations and all of that and strengths depending on the area. But it's important for you to know that there are different forms of love, not just in the romantic sense. When it comes to love, it can be expressed in many different ways. Person to person, people tend to have their own preferred ways to, for love to be expressed or ways of expression that, that help them feel loved the most. One person that receives an act of service may feel love a lot from that, whereas another person, not so much. Maybe physical touch is closer to feeling love. People receive love differently, and there can be many reasons why, based off upbringing, their past relationships, things they value, and I'll cover that more later in this video. Now, when it comes to giving and receiving love, it's really the centerpiece of all romantic relationships, and it's a form of value. Both people, for a healthy, sustainable relationship, need to be gaining some sort of value from it for it to be sustainable and healthy. You know, it can't just be too one-sided. And yes, you can love the person, but the truth is if this person isn't offering much to you, it becomes a codependent dynamic, which I'm going to touch more on. And that's not going to be very great for your mental health and just the relationship as a whole. So giving and receiving love is a centerpiece of a relationship. It's one of the most important parts of value. Now that raises a question. How do you figure out how someone receives love? How do you know that? Well, you have to communicate and understand the other person. One of my favorite models for this is the five love languages. I think his name is Gary. He wrote a book on the five love languages and he categorized five main approaches in which most people receive love, not just in a romantic dynamic, but also platonic friendships, family. Let's talk about these five love languages from a romantic context. So you have physical touch, quality time, words of affirmation, gift giving, and acts of service. Now, if you're in a relationship, it's ideal to know what your partner prefers. There's some people out there, it's kind of a mix of everything. There are others that it's like one or two things. You may want to get really specific. If someone likes quality time, like when do they like quality time? If somebody likes acts of service, what are those acts of service exactly? And when do you do those acts of service exactly? Not in a very robotic sense. You want it to just be in the back of your mind and it to be very natural throughout your relationship. You don't have to bring out a spreadsheet and say, oh, it's December and <laughs> on this day in December, I need to do this or else they're not gonna love me. Like, no, it's just something you keep in the back of your mind. And figuring out what your partner likes just comes down to communication. How do you feel loved the most? It's important to know that. And then they should know how you feel loved the most. That way, both of you can approach the relationship in a value giving uh, sort of way. And in a way in which you're confident that your partner feels loved the most. And also this isn't static, right? So as time goes on, continue to have those conversations, see if it changes, right? When you continue to communicate, then you can make sure you're both on the same page. Some people in relationships, prefer to text every single day. There are other people that don't. If you're on the same page about texting every single day, or at least being consistent with communication, then that's perfect. If you're not, then there's gonna be a, a disconnect there and the other person may feel a little left out. Now, it's important to remember also that 
just because you think something like that is ridiculous or you think something like that is uh is strange that someone would not feel love by not getting text that's from your vantage point you wouldn't doesn't mean the other person uh wouldn't as well so it's relative so either you continue to communicate or you find someone that has that sort of similar texting pattern as you <laughs> in that example and because that's such a small example, you don't want that to be some sort of like weird deal breaker because at the end of the day with relationships, there's having your standards and making sure the person's on board with where you want to take your life, but there's still a degree of compromise, not just in relationships, any sort of partnership in anything. Let's take business, let's take you and your friend, et cetera. There's always a degree of compromise because both of you have different best interests sometimes. And just because something's not in your best interest doesn't mean you shouldn't look into it. It may be in the best interest of the person that you're either friends with or a partner in something or you're in a romantic relationship. You still want to meet that in a sort of way. And when something's in your best interest, they should aim to meet that as well. Communication is very important here. So yeah, understand what, what that love language kind of is. For me, for example, words of affirmation it's nice, but it's not exactly my number one thing. My thing in my relationship is physical touch and quality time. I found that to be great. And this may take some analyzing of yourself. If you haven't been in a relationship before, it can take some self-reflection and just trying things out, dating around maybe. And as you date around or you're in a committed relationship, you can see, okay, where do I feel loved the most? and be very aware of that. When you understand where the other person's coming from and how they feel love, there's less of, I did this for you, et cetera. I did this, this, that, and that for you. And you shouldn't be acting like this because I did this and you should feel love because you know where they're coming from and you've listened. Remember that how you express love in your relationship, you're in a romantic sense, can shape your relationship dynamics and how the relationship pans out. Relationships take different turns or they start off certain ways based off behavior. Now, and I'll cover a few of them. First is codependence. This is often ignited by an insecure attachment style. I made a video on attachment styles. Check it out after this video. This is often due to insecure attachment styles like avoidant, anxious, maybe anxious and avoidant and disorganized. Sometimes, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag. Not everyone's one thing. Sometimes it's a mix. Let's look into a quote on it. Codependence is known as a relationship addiction. It takes place when one person believes it's their job to save another person by attending to all their needs. A codependent person builds their identity around this purpose and takes on a self-sacrificial role in the relationship. As you can see, not, not very healthy. Because at the end of the day, you need to value yourself even if you're in a relationship. You want to make sure your identity isn't tied to a relationship. A relationship is two separate identities, two separate egos coming together and creating a bond. But these two separate egos are not the relationship. They connect and create the relationship, but they are still two separate identities. When you understand this, you don't lose yourself in a relationship. You don't overly compromise and you can avoid things that lead to codependence. Codependence can have consequences for both the codependent person as well as their loved one. The relationship has the potential to become one-sided or destructive. You might feel frustrated, resentful, or stressed out as you neglect your own needs and prioritize your partners. You might even find yourself tolerating physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. And when a relationship fails or goes through a rough patch, you may experience a loss of self-worth because your identity is tied to your partner. Exactly. This is interesting too. Research suggests that there are maybe biological, psychological, and social elements that contribute to codependence. Biological, the prefrontal cortex part of a codependent person's brain may fail to suppress empathic responses. This would create an overbalance of empathy, making it easier to become codependent. People who are codependent may be psychologically predisposed to care for others. They might also be affected psychologically by negative life experiences, such as growing up with parents who fought a lot, or they are a victim of neglect or emotional abuse. Now, I'm going to quickly go over this list of signs of codependency. If you can relate to this, it's a sign that it's going on. Having a sense of walking on eggshells, often being the one who apologizes even if you have done nothing wrong, doing anything for the other person even if it makes you feel uncomfortable, putting the other person on a pedestal despite the fact that they don't merit this position, a need for other people to like you in order to feel good about yourself, struggling to find any time for yourself, especially if your free time consistently goes to the other person, feeling as if you've lost a sense of yourself within the relationship. Also, what you were taught indirectly or directly about relationships. So if you grew up and you had a mom or dad that was codependent or you had a mom or dad that had an 
and you had a step parent and your biological parent was codependent to that step parent, then you could indirectly learn to be codependent on your future partner. So overcoming codependence, you need to get clear on always meeting your needs and communicating your needs and valuing yourself. It's really that simple. Value yourself. Just you being alive is valuable. Just you existing. That's your first value. You're a unique individual. Have loved ones that care a lot for you and see a lot of value in you. You can literally probably make a long list of how valuable you are, but it's not about me telling you that you're valuable. It's about you feeling value by seeing your value and not relying on other people to validate your value. That's where a lot of people run into problems. So next is detachment. A degree of detachment is important in a relationship because like I said, the relationship is not your identity. You still have your life going on. Even in a marriage, you are joined together, probably live in the same place, but you still have your life. Your partner is not your world. They're part of your world. You're not their world. You can have a lot of love for the person, absolutely love them, yes. You can do a lot of things with them. You can have a lot of goals together, etc. I'm not saying not do that, but you still have your life outside of them. You still want to have your hobbies. You still want to have your purpose or the work you do. You still want to have maybe your fitness routine. You still want to have your group of friends. You still want to have your family members that you keep in touch with. You still want to have, you know, your self-reflection time, self-improvement, all of this stuff. So you can do things with your partner, but you still want to have that detachment that allows you to grow other areas of your life. A lot of people have this weird mentality of my life is over when I get married or when you have kids, like you, you, you stop living or something. No, it's like you just adjust your time for things. You start to be more mindful of your time. It's like, yes, you have kids, take care of them. <laughs> Don't neglect them, take care of your kids. But like, okay, how creative can I get about making time for myself, about making time for my hobbies, my friends? You just need to get more creative. Next, build your self-esteem, your feeling of yourself, your self-image. Build that up. Make sure it's positive. Avoid that negative self-talk. And this requires awareness. When you're dodging negative self-talk, you're constantly aware of what you're telling yourself throughout the day. And then you're reframing all of those, all those things. You mess up in something. Okay. I'm learning instead of, Oh, if only I was smarter, <laughs> like no, because your mind and body keep score when it comes to that words slash affirmations you tell yourself, when it comes to the feelings that get evoked from that, when it comes to your thoughts and how you add an emotional charge to those thoughts, it keeps the score. And then it starts to paint the picture of who you are. It starts to paint the identity of who you are. So if the person that's constantly thinking negative thoughts, not the end of the world, but they're constantly thinking negative thoughts and then they're adding an emotional charge to those negative thoughts, that's a problem. The body takes that more seriously. Now it's like, oh, wow, this is probably true, but you're moldable. So when we have the negative thoughts, but we don't identify with it, we don't allow an emotion, our emotions to get connected to it. We just watch it. They have less of a pull on us. And we stick to the positive affirmations we tell ourselves and we add an emotional charge to that because that's the self-image we want to build. This builds our self-esteem. Also, this may require a degree of self-efficacy, the belief that you can do this. Because if you don't have the belief that you can do things, you're not going to make it happen no matter what. Self-efficacy is like a meta frame of building self-esteem. People have so many past experiences of not having high self-esteem that it's harder for them to believe that they can build high self-esteem. With self-efficacy, you're like, I am capable of doing it. So it's kind of two things here. And when it comes to handling a partner in a codependent relationship, like let's say your partner's codependent, is communication. Telling them, hey, I need a little more time to do this. Making sure that they are understanding healthy dynamics of a relationship and that you're not their end-all be-all. That's very important. And in fact, before you even get into a relationship, look for signs that someone may be a little codependent and talk to them about that. If it doesn't fit, then it just doesn't fit. You don't want to force it. So important. Next, another relationship dynamic, toxicity, jealousy, projection, dark triad traits like narcissism, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, things like past trauma. These are traits that people may have. Here's a quote, quote, toxic relationship is one that makes you feel supported, misunderstood, demeaned, or attacked. Any relationship that makes you feel worse rather than better can become toxic over time. People with mental illnesses such as bipolar disorder, major depression, or even depressive tendencies may be particularly susceptible to toxic relationships since they are already sensitive to negative emotions. That's a great quote. And awareness is so key. I, I always go back to awareness because if you know that something is going on, you now have attention towards it. You can do something about it. The biggest problem is people aren't even aware of toxicity. And then if they are, 
let's say they check off the self-awareness part, they're emotionally addicted to the person and they can't set that boundary of, I'm not going to deal with this. And like the quote said, if they have mental health issues and or are more susceptible to negative emotions, then it's going to be even worse for them. I also have a video on emotional addictions. If someone's constantly used to feeling depressed and connecting emotional charges to their negative thoughts, they're going to be used to feeling negative and that's going to be their norm. And then healthy relationships will feel weird. And then what happens when someone gets into a healthy relationship when they were in toxic ones? They self-sabotage. They look to sabotage the relationship. They create fights. They create problems out of thin air because they're going back to safety and they're going back to what they're used to. Continuing on, such relationships can often leave you feeling ashamed, humiliated, misunderstood, or unsupported. Signs of a toxic relationship. Blaming, competitiveness, controlling behaviors, disrespect, dishonesty, gaslighting, hostility, jealousy, passive aggressive behaviors, poor communication, stresses. Now, I do want to say this. You want to make sure you're seeing multiple points of toxic signs. If your partner is like passive aggressive, like once, it's not a toxic relationship. You know, if you accidentally kind of gaslighted them once it's not a toxic relationship but if every time they bring up something and you're gaslighting all the time and you know you're looking back and you're thinking of multiple instances where you have done it then yeah uh you're creating toxicity in the relationship it's good to look into that without overly guilting yourself um and you know beating yourself up for it it's just a learning experience other signs you feel consistently disrespected or that you your needs aren't being met you feel a toll on your self-esteem over time. You bring out the worst in each other. Oh man, how many movies are on that? <laughs> Couples bringing the worst out in each other. You are not your best self around the person. Yep. You spend a lot of time and emotional strength trying to cheer them up. Yeah. You are always to blame. They turn things around. So things you thought they had done wrong are suddenly your fault. Gaslighting textbook. Also with toxic relationships, there are some like tactics, whether they're done consciously or unconsciously, that can uh, be be quite a doozy. So first you have love bombing. So this is over the top displays of affection, especially early on. Like let's say you met someone and you guys have been literally dating for a week, not even in a relationship. Like maybe you're just getting to know each other, and then the other person's like, uh, "I just bought you a couple gifts. I love you." all this stuff like it's too much too soon and it's a bit of a red flag because love can often takes time and a lot of times when people think they're in love it's really just infatuation this is something that tinder swindler used when it came to how he approached women he love bombed them he got them gifts he did all this stuff and a lot of the women were manipulated in that sort of way also another tactic is the lover boy method so um, people like pimps and unfortunately traffickers can use this approach to get people to fall in love with them and then they use them for you know illegal services and all this stuff it can really ruin somebody's life so keep that in mind so back to toxic relationships it's so so important to be aware of toxic dynamics and to communicate and if the person's not getting it you need to let them go because at the end of the day it's your life life is finite in this human body of yours and you don't have time for all of that like my relationship, if there's a conflict of some kind, we talk it out right there and then. <laughs> we don't wait a week. We don't give each other the silent treatment. We're not passive aggressive, right? The communication is right then and there. And then we're honest about it and then we it moves on. Like there's no time for, like it doesn't fester and there's no resentment that builds up. You know, that's, that's what a healthy relationship looks like. No tires are being slashed. <laughs> People aren't being locked outside of places. <laughs> you know, conflict is just handled. And not to make lightly of those situations, but I'm painting a picture here. Secure attachments, feeling of trust, bonding, growth, communication, patience, and expression. Quote, some evidence suggests that the ability to form a stable relationship, aka a secure relationship, starts to form in infancy. And a child's earliest experiences with a caregiver who, who reliably meets the infant's needs for food, care, warmth, protection, stimulation, and social contact. Such relationships are not destiny, but they are theorized to establish deeply ingrained patterns of relating to others. Yeah, I talked about that in Understanding People, Part 24, Attachment Styles. So 
In a secure relationship, you feel confident in your partner. You feel confident that they're willing to devote time into you. You're aware of each other's strengths and weaknesses and you accommodate each other as time goes on. You guys grow and, and all of that. Both of you kind of change a little bit. There's still a sense of confidence that even if we're growing, we're still growing together. Secure relationships, partners are typically grateful for each other and very open with communication and showing affection. Both understand each other's boundaries as well, right? What each will or won't tolerate and they communicate that very openly. Another one is interesting is benefit of the doubt. And of course, trust is, a, is another big thing. All of this can show up in many relationship types, right? Not just serious relationships, serious monogamous relationships. All these dynamics can show up in casual relationships, open relationships, which open relationships can still be serious, right? We want to keep that in mind, uh, but it can still be there. Also long distance relationships, and also non-monogamous relationships like polyamory and things like that. Whatever relationship you prefer, go for it. You are not a bad person, quote unquote, by society standards or whatever. If you prefer a certain type of relationship, if you gravitate to a certain type of relationships, someone that's into non-monogamy or someone that's into just casual relationship, it's what you prefer. So tell everyone to take a hike. <laughs> I think religion is one of the biggest contributors to shame around the type of relationship you want to have. Also social norms, as I touched on, people feel like they can't have the type of relationship they want because fear around being judged and all this stuff. It's your life. At the end of the day, I talk about valuing yourself. That's all I got to say about that. When it comes to these relationship types, a question that could come up is, okay, how do you know which one is right for you? Right? Like, let's say you've gotten religion out of your head and all this stuff. Now you're, you're, you're thinking for yourself. You're like, okay, what is right for me? Well, there's multiple factors you can consider. First is your preferences, obviously. Um, so that you don't waste time. What do you prefer? And this may require you to test out different things, right? Maybe, maybe you're not sure you want to be in a serious relationship yet. You try the casual thing, you learn some things and you're like, okay, I'll do the casual thing for now. And then, and then you maybe meet the person you want to be with and you become monogamous, uh, or vice versa, whatever. Uh, so preferences next is values. What do you value, right? What's important to you in a relationship is commitment important. Okay. Then, then keep that in mind. Is having more free time for yourself keep that in mind right maybe you want to be single for a little for a little bit of time or maybe you need a relationship where you have a lot of time for yourself still where the other person you're with understands that next is life goals where you want to take your life because when you understand that you can communicate that like hey i want to be here around this time or i want to move here at some point that way both of you know you're on the same page stage in life. Maybe you're in your twenties and you're in college and you're focused on like graduating. You're focused on your career or you're in thirties. You're focused on like other stuff outside relationships. Perfect. Right. Don't rush yourself. If you have other focuses and you're in a stage in your life where you don't, you don't have time, then you just don't have time. Next is time and responsibilities. Like, do you have time for it? Because a relationship, you spend time together and you do, you go places together and it does take up time. It can be very fulfilling, but it does take up time. If you have a lot of responsibilities, you have to see how that, how the, how your relationship will fit into that. Also, you can see how the person you're with can help with your responsibilities. Maybe you're busy one day and they help you with running errands because you don't have time. You know, you hear about couples that work together, right? That may not be what you prefer, but some people, it works for them. With my girlfriend, a lot of times I'm working at her place when I, when I visit, right? Like we spend time together and then we have like some work blocks together and it's great and it works. And then sometimes when there's work that I have on my other computer, and or it's like intensive where I need to like think a lot and all of that, like doing these videos and all of that, then I'll probably need that time for myself. So that's that's a big thing. Also, personality. What's your personality like? If you've taken the those personality tests around psychology, perfect. Look into that. Now, where are the pillars of a great relationship? Let's talk about that. Psychologist Robert Sternberg's triangle theory of love gives us a better understanding of the components that make up love. His theory considers three dimensions of relationships, intimacy, passion, and commitment. Intimacy allows us to feel close to our partners, trust them, and to be vulnerable. But building intimacy can be difficult, especially if you need help knowing where to start. Some things around building intimacy is thorough communication, checking in with your partner, showing appreciation and gratitude. That's very important. Being present with them aka quality time. Next, passion. Passion can be the physical or mental connection between two people. Doing a lot of things together, doing new things together, unexpected things together, spontaneity, 
that really helps when celebrating each other's life milestones, really celebrating each other. And this is an interesting one, taking time apart. Because when something's not in the fray, its value typically goes up in, in the human mind. Time away from each other is very important because obviously you have other things to do with your life, but also it creates that healthy space for you to basically miss each other. You definitely want that because it, it adds passion to the relationship. Commitment, loyalty, being honest, making time for each other, and just building understanding of one another. And it really helps both of you feel that you're committed to, uh, to one another. It's about really showing it, not just saying it. I think that's very important. I also want to add though self-management. What is self-management? Self-management is your ability to regulate yourself and being very self-aware of yourself. That's why I have this channel. I want people to be able to be aware of, hey, this is where I'm showing a bit of toxic traits. This is where I'm not as honest as I want to be. This is where I did good. This is where I could be better. And then with self-management, you can now approach your partner with, okay, I tend to do this, that, and the third, and then you take in their input as well. This is a great way to build a conscious, healthy relationship. And also add detachment, like I touched on earlier in this video, you need a degree of detachment because you are still an individual identity that has a lot to give to the world, a lot to give to other people in your life, and a lot to give to yourself. Being detached also helps prevent codependent tendencies, helps prevent things like overthinking in a relationship, helps prevent so many neurotic behaviors that can come about by not having a degree of detachment. You can also build detachment by valuing yourself, by having things going on, by also having universal love, not just human love. Universal love is love for existence itself. And I know this isn't as practical and hard nosed as all the things I talked about in this video, but it's something you should look into understanding non-duality, understanding that love comes in so many shapes and I can feel deep love in so many ways. I can do meditations that invoke so much love within me and love for everything else to a point where my love isn't just confined to a person, it's confined to so many things. I can get a sort, I could get a sense of love from so many things. That's very powerful. And obviously it's not talked about a lot because we're so fixated on the romantic form of love that there are so many other forms of love out there.